video, we focus primarily on populations. Today, we're going to be looking at communities. In ecology, a community is an assemblage of populations of different species interacting with one another. Community ecology is the branch of ecology that studies the interactions between and among species. It considers how such interactions, along with uh, the interactions with the abiotic environment, affect community structures and species richness, diversity, and patterns of abundance. Uh, really, we're going to be looking at species interactions and all of that entails. Competition is probably the most commonly thought of type of species interaction, uh, two species or individuals within a species fighting for a resource. Uh, usually occurs if an organism is sharing the same niche. Competition is common. It drives of evolution, it drives survival, but two species with identical ecological niches cannot coexist in the same habitat. Uh, competition usually results in a decrease in the population of species that the less adapted species. Um, if you look at the example on the right, you have a fundamental and a realized niche. The fundamental niche is where the species could live if there was no competition. The realized niche takes competition into account. Now, over time, you can have something called resource partitioning. Uh, say, for example, you have birds living in a tree and they all feed on insects in the tree. Uh, you can reduce the competition for those resources by splitting up the parts of trees. So basically, you can almost make a, a sub-realized niche within an area, and you can lessen the effects of competition. Symbiotic relationships are a broad range of species interactions. Uh, organisms require a certain amount of food, water, space, shelter to survive. When the availability of the amount of any of these resources in a given area is less than what the various populations need, it becomes a limiting factor. So species, uh, they can interact to allow greater access to resources. Um, Parasitism, mutualism, commensalism, and umensalism are the four most common types of symbiotic relationship, and you should be familiar with at least two of these. Parasitism is a symbiotic relationship in which one organism, the parasite, benefits at the expense of the other organism, the host. Some parasites live within the host, such as tapeworms or heartworms. Some parasites feed on the external surface of a host, such as fleas or aphids or mistletoe. The parasite host populations that have survived have been those where neither has a devastating effect on the other. Parasitism that results in the rapid death of the host is devastating to both the parasite and the host population. So it's very important that the hosts survive and thrive long enough for the parasite to reproduce and spread. Mutualism is a symbiotic relationship in which both organisms benefit. Because the two organisms work closely together, they help each other survive. Uh, for example, bacteria, which have the ability to digest wood, live within the digestive tracts of termites. Plant roots provide food for fungi that break down nutrients the plants need. Uh, the cattle egrets eat insects off of the cattle. So mutualism, both organisms involved benefit. Commensalism is a harder one. It's, commensalism is a symbiotic relationship in which one organism benefits and the other organism is not affected. Uh, barnacles that attach to whales are dispersed to different environments where they can obtain food and resources. Burdock seeds, those little seeds that get into your hair and dog's fur and so off, they're carried to locations where they can germinate. Uh, Umensalism is kind of related to this, so in commensalism, one benefits and the other is unaffected. In amensalism, one is harmed and the other is unaffected. Um, so say, example, the grass that surrounds a watering hole is trampled by organisms drinking from the watering hole. So it's harmed, but the organisms don't really notice the grass. Predation is really essential to looking at how species evolve. Uh, predation and herbivory, one organism eats another. One organism benefits and the other is harmed. It provides a very strong selective pressure. Predators need to find and subdue their prey, so claws and teeth and uh, speed. Prey adaptations, they need to elude and defend. Uh, so prey, yeah, there's three major categories there. You have cryptic coloration, you have that camouflage, aposematic coloration like the frog here, very warning, very bright colors, and Batesian and Mullerian mimicry. In Batesian mimicry, you look like a harmful thing, but you're actually harmless. And in Mullerian, they're both harmful. Um, 
So looking at this example, we have a fly and we have a bee, but they both have that same look. So the fly is harmless, but it looks kind of like a bee, so it's going to be avoided. Therefore, it is a Batesian mimicry. Predation is an interaction between species in which one species hunts, kills, and eats the other. That interaction helps regulate the populations within an ecosystem, thereby causing it to become stable. Fluctuations in predator-prey populations are very predictable. At some point, the prey population grows so numerous, they're easy to find. If you look at that graph, you can see that boom and bust in between the different species. And there's a little bit of a delay between the peaks called the lag time. As the prey population increases, the predation, the predator population increases. As the predator population increases, the prey decreases. So it's going to be a constant cycle, a constant fluctuation between predator and prey. Within that idea, you have energy. Energy is transferred through the trophic levels, the parts of a food chain. So organisms have energy roles in their environment, and each role is determined by how the organism obtains its energy and how they interact with other organisms. So sunlight comes in and provides energy to producers. Those producers are eaten by herbivores or primary consumers. Primary consumers are then consumed by secondary consumers. So these are the carnivores. And then those secondary consumers can be eaten by levels above them, a tertiary consumer or a quaternary consumer. We don't tend to see food chains that are a lot longer than these uh, tertiary, maybe quaternary uh, consumer levels because energy is being transferred. And we know the laws of thermodynamics, energy can be transferred, but it's not 100% efficient. And we're going to look at that in a moment. But all organisms connect back to my decomposers and my detritivores for the breakdown of that material for the cycle to continue. Autotrophs are going to be those organisms that produce their own food, like the producers. And heterotrophs are going to be any organism that eat other organisms. I do need to clarify one thing. Decomposers chemically break down dead organisms, whereas detritivores mechanically break down dead organisms. So detritivores are going to break it down, but decomposers are going to be the ultimate thing that breaks it down to keep the cycles going. So looking at that inefficiency, how much energy is lost? Where is the energy lost to? Well, if you look at an organism, about half of the energy that goes into the organism is going to release as waste or feces. Um, another, say, 33% is going to be lost to keeping the energy production, cellular respiration. So in this organism, all of that energy is lost to daily living. That leaves about 17% for growth. That growth is the only energy that can be moved on to the next level in the food chain. All organisms have a different percentage based off of efficiency, and we summarize this down to what's called the 10% rule. 10% of the energy will transfer on to the next trophic level. So if I have 100 joules of energy in a plant, the herbivore is going to get 10%, and the carnivore that eats the herbivore is going to get 1% of that energy from the initial plant. The energy pyramid is a graphical representation of the energy flow in an ecosystem. The amount of energy that moves from one trophic level to another is not the same. Um, so looking at this overall, I know that sunlight comes in, and I can see the numbers of species in a population, or I can calculate it out. Uh, so say, for example, I had a billion plants. Well, I'm going to end up about 100,000 primary consumers, 100 secondary consumers, one tertiary consumer. To support one tertiary consumer in this example, it takes a billion plants. That each trophic level only passes on so much energy. Each trophic level is only able to support so many organisms. So looking overall, however, I see that pyramid. It's going to get less and less as I go up. Sometimes the pyramid of numbers can look a little strange because of the different amounts. It's not 10%. It varies depending on where you are, what type of organism that you're dealing with. So please realize that the 10% is for the pyramids of energy, not for the pyramids of numbers. Food webs take into account multiple food chains. You have the dynamic of um, energy through ecosystems, 
uh, food webs. They describe the organisms in a particular ecosystem found in interconnecting food chains. Uh, they're very complex and they show that energy flow. Uh, some organisms can come in at multiple levels. So you do need to be aware of that. One thing that can be kind of tricky is if you look at the arrows, what it's pointing to is what is doing the eating. Okay, so you have a baleen whale, for example, being eaten by humans. Be very careful when you look at the diagrams not to draw the arrows the wrong way. Food webs give a lot more information than food chains, and they can be very useful for understanding an ecosystem.